So, welcome to my talk about Julia in Python's Den. <laughs> Julia has some bold claims, like that it looks like Python, feels like Lisp and runs like C, which is somehow true and somehow isn't, so we'll take a look at this. So, something about me, I'm working as machine learning engineer at Avast slash like a AI ops engineer. And I've been using Python for almost six years and more than two and a half years with Julia. I'm on GitHub and many other social networks. So, what I'll be talking about today. Uh, I'll tell you what is Julia and how does it compare to Python, like if you will have some project and you will have Python as your default because this is PyData and you will be deciding whether you want to use Julia or not, like what should you consider, why to use Julia instead of Python or why not and when. Of course, I'll share with you some experience with running Julia in production because at Avast we are running some applications in Julia at production in production for more than uh, one year, and it's still running and it somehow works. And also, you can call Julia from Python and call Python from Julia, which is quite neat but has some disadvantages. So, the context, why Julia has been created, like why we need yet another programming language, like there wouldn't be too many of them already. If, okay, so who has heard about Julia before? Okay, quite a lot of people, perfect. And who has tried to code something in Julia? Okay, few people. Thank you, you're very brave. So, <laughs> for the rest of you, why would you be interested in Julia? In general, if you are doing machine learning, I guess who has done some machine learning here, at least some fitting, some mathematical model, okay, so quite a lot. So, you may know that you need some flexibility because you just need to do lots of prototyping and try and out different approaches, but you also need speed because you have lots of data. And Python itself is quite slow and quite bad at handling data on its own. That's why we have all the PyData stack like NumPy, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit, scikit-learn, scipy, and so on, which are basically C, C++, and Fortran backends with Python wrappers, and that makes them really fast and lets you do some serious computations using the flexibility of Python, which is cool, but it has the disadvantage that you have two languages, so you have the performant language and the flexible language, which uses wrapper for the performant one. Usually, you are quite okay with it if you are doing some basic stuff, but if you are figuring out, hunting down some bugs and you figure out that you are debugging through the Python and you find out that the bug is inside the Fortran or inside the C++, you're quite screwed unless you are proficient in C++ or Fortran. So, Julia tries to solve this by having one language which is as flexible as Python and as performant as C++ of, or Fortran or C. So Julia is good for, of course, machine learning, mathematical modeling, simulations, and differentiable programming. I don't think it, has, uh, it makes sense to use Julia for anything else than this, apart from some educational purposes, because for explaining neural networks and explaining differentiable programming, I find Julia quite useful because I think it's easier to install Julia than TensorFlow. <laughs> in some cases and the code looks simpler and looks more like math which is useful when you are trying to describe the concepts. So you need, as I said, you need the speed and the flexibility and the current solutions are somehow two languages and you either are stuck with Python and can't debug in C++ or you need to master two languages. So, Julia started already 10 years ago, the, but they were working quite a lot for many years when it was in, under heavy development and four years ago, almost four years ago the version 1, 1.0.0 was released and since then there were many other newer versions. The latest stable version was released like one month ago and there is also LTS, the long-term support version, which is the 166 released at late March. 
So in general, Julia is high level, high performance, dynamic language for technical computing. The nice things about Julia are that it, in the standard libraries, it supports uh, distributed parallel execution, so you can perform computations on some cluster out of the box using just the standard libraries, don't need anything else. It has good numerical accuracy and sophisticated compiler. The compiler is, compiler is LLVM. Who has heard about LLVM? Okay, few people. So for the rest of you, LLVM is low-level virtual machine. It's basically something like virtual machine, but it compiles your code into the native co machine code. So it compiles to really fast code that pro the, the CPU understands well. And if it gets compiled properly, it's really fast, as, as fast as C. Julia has REPL, which you probably know, the interactive shell where you can type things and computations happen. And Julia can also run in Jupyter Notebook quite natively. Maybe you know that uh, when Jupyter was, was founded or invite, invented in 2014, it actually standed for, the name actually stands for Julia Python R because from the beginning the Jupyter project was designed to support R, Python and also Julia from the beginning, out of the box. Julia is probably the only uh, high-level language which is able to of petascale compute that was achieved during the Celeste project where it ran on the Cori supercomputer and it achieved 1.5 petaflop per second. There are, pro there are other projects which were able to achieve this performance, but they were in Fortran or C or C++. Maybe Python could do it if these people got to big enough cluster because you can't achieve this without a really big cluster. So this is a benchmark to show you how fast Julia, Julia can get. This is somehow mandatory slide to show to people when we are talking about Julia. <laughs> so you have some benchmarks. Oh yeah, you can see you have some benchmarks. You have the C for reference, and then you have dots for how fast or slow it's compared to C. So Fortran has many benchmarks faster than C. Julia is sometimes a bit better, but sometimes a bit slower than C and the other languages are quite slow, the octave being the worst. So, why would you want to use Julia? Julia looks and feels quite like, like Python. If I should compare it, I think Python is the closest to Julia in the uh, syntax that it looks really uh, quite similarly. It's generally fast like C, but has some caveats like you need to know something about type system and write type stable code because if your code is type unstable, it's as slow as Python. Julia has math, MATLAB like uh, math notations, which I think is nice because it really looks like math. And because Julia also supports uh, Unicode, you can name your variables and using the Greek letters, so it really can look like meh, but it's quite performant code, which I like. The statistics, I think it's quite easy to do in Julia because it looks more like meh, so I would say it's as easy as in R, but maybe quite bold statement. Julia has multiple dispatch. Who knows what is multiple dispatch? Okay, few people. So, multiple dispatch is a property of language that if you have function, you can have different implementations for different uh, types of the inputs. It's a bit like the overloading or inheritance, but it works the same for all arguments and you can dispatch on different arguments and specialize your code for different, for many arguments of your functions. So that lets you write generic yet performant code for some use cases, which can be really nice. And as you can call C from Python, which is quite easy because Python, the C Python interpreter is based on C, so the C extensions are quite natural. You can call also C from Julia, you can call also Fortran from Julia, but that's the same with Python. And you can also call Python from Julia and Julia from Python, which is nice. Julia has parallel computing, which is more powerful than Python because as we know, Python has GIL, 
or Jill. Gil, yeah, Gil. So Julia doesn't have the global interpreter lock, which is really nice and makes you, lets you utilize the threads in much powerful manner. And it can also quite well uh, multi-process using several processes at once. It has built-in package manager, which has good support of Git, so you can just take any Git repo which has the conventions of Julia package and use it as your package, which is, ni which is nice. And Julia has great type system. As you may know in Python, in Python everything under the hood is just pi object, which is the value and some metadata about it. And the interpreter can't optimize much because it doesn't know that well what type of is it. So if you want some really high performance code, you use NumPy or Numba, which do some kind of type inference or use strict typing. Because as we know, NumPy uses strict typing and you can't mis mix different data types in NumPy or TensorFlow or PyTorch. And Julia is general purpose in the sense that you can theoretically write anything in Julia, but you like the ecosystem, which is why I'm getting to why you would not want to use Julia. Julia is still quite young. The ecosystem isn't mature enough. There is lots of libraries and lots of them is in version 0. Point something, which we probably know from Python a few years ago. Where, but finally we have pandas one point something, which is great in Python. Some packages are not stable enough, which is a bit unpleasant. Sometimes the documentation isn't good enough and there isn't enough examples. So you get stuck with reading the tests, reading the source code, which can be challenging. It lacks some external toolings and corporate support from some tools. For example, at Avast, we are using Artifactory, which is like general package manager, supports many languages and tools but doesn't support Julia. So when we want to use Julia in production, we need to figure out how we want to package our internal packages when the main package repository doesn't support this, which was quite fun. There is no JetBrains IDE, which is very sad. You can find Julia uh, extension for, Py, uh, for PyCharm and IntelliJ, but it sucks. And uh, two years ago, I reported many bugs and they haven't resolved them. So in Julia, we use VS Code, which is, under which is being developed quite a lot and is quite pleasant to work in. There isn't many things on Stack Overflow for Julia, which is very sad. You can find some things, but definitely not many. And Julia community has discourse. Who has heard about discourse? Yeah, no one. That's the issue. No one knows it. So it's kind, some kind of forum, which is also like question answer based. So people are asking there, other people are answering. You can upvote the quest or heart the questions, but it's also not big enough to actually support you in your daily work, as well as the Stack Overflow supports you when you are coding in Python. Julia does not have configurable garbage collector, which might not be a problem for many of you, but if you encounter some problems with garbage collections and you want to tune the constants of the garbage collector so it would run, run more often, less often, you can do it just by calling some function in Julia and you need to recompile Julia with different flags, which can be painful, especially if you want reproducible builds and have the building of Julia in your CI pipeline. So Julia has some quirks. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. The good quirks are that you c it has macro to show you the generated assembly from your function. So it's high level language and you can see the assembly that is being executed, which is nice. And sometimes the assembly fits one page even. You can pre force pre-compilation of some packages because the Julia has the runtime, which has just in time compilation based on LLVM. And you can enforce some compilation to be ahead of time. Because if you don't do this, the first run when the compilation happens is quite slow. Because in Julia, you have the code, you run it. And if it hasn't been compiled for the specific types you are calling it with, it, get, it gets compiled and it can compile quite a lot of code and that can be quite slow. 
in Julia it's called like TT, like time to first plot. Like when you are, want to just plot some some graph or function, like the time to first plot is the time from startup of the program to time when the first plot appears, and it can and it can get quite high. Like sometimes it takes minutes if you don't have anything precompiled, which can be bothersome. Uh, you can manipulate the packages from inside Julia. That Julia has the package. Um, manager which you which runs inside Julia so if you have already running Julia and you figure out you need some new package you just type package at the name of the package which is great that you don't have to kill the runtime and type pip install something and bring it back up that's very useful and saves you some time but it has some caveats like upgrading package. If you are using old package and want to upgrade it, if you have already loaded the package into the runtime and, it lo and you upgraded the package, the runtime already has the compiled functions from the old version and doesn't uh, package registry, which is Git repo, fully managed by GitHub bots, that if you want to run a uh, if you want to register new version of package or new package, you just call uh, write comment regis Julia registrator register your package, and the bot is triggered. It creates pull request with the changes to the package registry, and then there is another bot which is running on schedule, performing uh, unit and integration tests on the top of the package registry, and everything that passes the tests gets merged, which is quite neat. Julia has broadcasting on language level, so if you want to call some function on every element of an array, Julia has native support for it, so you don't need to call like map. Like in Python, you can just put dot there and it gets broadcasted and you can do type uh, multiple dispatch and specialize your functions for the broadcasting. And Julia has pipes similar to R, which I quite like. And the controversies. Julia is one based, has one based indexing. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's controversial one. Uh, the package manager in Julia, as I mentioned, works well with Git, but it also means that there is like Git everywhere. It's not the Git, the official implementation, the command line. It's uh, the GitLib C extension, which has some quirks, like when you need to deal with SSH keys and also proxy server, it can get quirky and you don't Google the answer because no one has dealt with it <laughs> before you. And Julia programmers can't shut up about its type system, me including. Uh, of course, if you don't handle the types well, you get type instable code and that really hurts the performance and it's not that easy to hunt down. There are some tools which help you with detecting the type stability of your code, but it can get tricky if your code base is larger. Yeah, I spoke about the non-flexible the non GC and the precompilation and the code start problem get quite funky in Docker because in Docker you have the layers and if you want to precompile the Julia, so some of the compilation would happen and the build time of the Docker image and not during the startup of the container because you want the container to start up as soon as, as quickly as possible. Some of the code gets precompiled, but some doesn't. And I tried to save like 10 minutes of our startup time of our production containers by precompiling it during the build time and I didn't succeed. So our containers take like, sometimes like 10 minutes to actually start and run the web server after everything's compiled, which is tricky in Kubernetes when you have to configure properly the startup probe and liveness probe and readiness probe so Kubernetes wouldn't kill your image container because it would think, oh, it's stuck, but your container is just compiling lots of code. So let us see some code. I prepared some really simple benchmark in NumPy and in Julia. It's just looping over array oh, in NumPy and also in PyPython. So we have array, we just loop over it and we multiply num each number by two and then power it by two. And in NumPy you have the broadcasting, so you just 
type the things and that's it. In Ju and then we have some branching, so we have condition and we want to multiply number by two if it's less than 1000 or multiply by three if it's more. In NumPy, I have used the vectorization trick. Who, has, who, of New York, who of you knows the vectorization trick like this to avoid branching? Yeah, so you learn something. So in NumPy, you can do this. So you, multi you compute the both values. So you compute both multiple two and three, which is more costly than computing only one of this. But you multiply it by the condition, which gets cast into the integer. So you multiply by one and by zero every element, and it's really fast. So that's a quite nice vectorization magic, which makes your Python code quite performant. And you can see the benchmark. So for we run it for 100 times and do stuff for array of 10,000, which takes almost a quarter of a second in pure Python. But in NumPy, we take 10 times larger array. It's 60 millisecond. In 60 milliseconds. In Julia, it's 1 millisecond and 18 milliseconds. So for this dummy benchmark, Julia is faster. And also you can see here the broadcasting. If there is a dot, it's broadcast, like apply this function to every element of an array. So X is an array, you multiply every element by two and then you power the element by two. And yeah, this, I haven't used the vectorization trick here. I could have used that is, but I'm just looping there to see, to show that even with the looping, it's faster than NumPy. So, automatic differentiation, which is one of the other nice things about Julia. Who has heard about automatic differentiation? Okay, and who has trained some neural networks? Okay, so all of you who have turned some, trained some neural networks have used automatic differentiation. Automatic differentiation is a way to obtain gradients or differences derivatives of some functions with respect to inputs. So neural network is just mathematical function. Each layer is a function and it's like nested function, lots of nested functions. And if you perform the gradient descent inside the, during the gradient, uh, stochastic gradient descent, if you perform the one step of the gradient descent, you compute the gradient with respect to the weights of the neural network and you update the weights of the neural networks based on this gradient. So you take the gradient, multiply it by the learning rate and subtract, the, subtract it from the weights of the neural network. So you need to obtain the gradient from arbitrary function because you just type your neural network layers and arbitrary functions and you want to get derivative of your code you have written and you want to have it in automatic way. Julia has native support, which is great, but if you are using Python, you are using TensorFlow or PyTorch, they are also able to do the automatic differentiation. They have it implemented. You just don't know about it mostly. So this is the example. In Julia, there is a package called Zygote for the differentiation, because as we know from biology, Zygote differentiates. In TensorFlow, yeah, in TensorFlow, we just use TensorFlow and here we have PyTorch. So here I defined some simple function that's like quadratic optimization, but here we are the, uh, computing gradient with respect to X, which is not that usual, but just for the example, I defined one vector, second vector, one matrix. We just multiply the vector transposed vector by matrix by the vector and add it to the transposed vector times that's the matrix multiplication with the other vector. This is our loss function. We compute it and then we call gradient and we obtain our gradient with respect to X. If you want to do this in TensorFlow, you need to, you can use the NumPy arrays for the value for the values where you are not computing gradient, but if you want to compute gradient with respect to variable, you need to use TF variable and you don't have this nice notation. So you need to have array in array if you want to get matrix. And TensorFlow doesn't have uh, dot T for transposing. So you need to call the TF transpose 
and you need to, if you want to multiply by scalar value, you need to wrap it inside and inside NP array, otherwise it doesn't work. And then you can call your loss, the value is the same, and you can either use the computational graph, which we don't want to do because it's quite tedious when you are experimenting, so you use gradient tape and call the loss, and then you call tape gradient and you get your gradient. In PyTorch it's a bit nicer, but you need to specify if you want the gradient or not. When you are defining the, the variable, you can use the, yeah, this is the Python notation for matrix multiplication, which is quite nice. And after you compute your loss, you call loss backward, which performs the backward pass through the uh, computation, and then you obtain your gradient. So this is when Julia is a bit nicer than Python. And you can flex with the macros, so if you want to see what is the assembly code generated by the compiler when we are computing the loss function, this is the assembly and it did fit into one slide. <laughs> so why would you want to use Julia for machine learning? Or why we at Avas decided to use Julia for machine learning? Because in our use case we have hierarchical data, we don't have like vector or tensor, we have dictionaries or arrays of dictionaries. This is small part of our training sample, which is dictionary with single key, which has, which is dictionary, yeah, which has two keys, scalar value or some array. And here it's array of dictionaries, which contain array, array, dictionary of array of some numerical arrays, numerical array, yeah, and numerical values. So we have quite wild data types and quite, nest, quite deep nested data, which have lots of different sizes. For example, when we have arrays, sometimes the array is like 10, uh, 10 samples long array. Sometimes it's 100,000 samples long array. So every sample in your training data can get quite big or quite small and one sample can be like 10,000 times larger than the other. Which is really fun if you want to do proper mini-batching and utilize your CPU. And we are also training with missing values, so if you don't have some value and you have it missing, you don't want to put just zeros there or some dummy value because that would be not that good, you would just force the neural networks to use this value. But you can, in Julia, it's flexible enough that you can train some value instead. So if data is missing, we can train the vector instead of it. And so the neural network like decides what is the best representation for the missing data given the task you are optimizing for, which can be nice for such weird data we are using. Of course, when you have like mini batch where you have lots of different arrays belonging to different samples, you need to aggregate it. And because you need to aggregate over the samples in your mini batch, we are using segmented aggregations, which are also in TensorFlow and PyTorch. Sometimes we are using uh, sparse matrices because the data can be quite sparse, so it's better to use sparse, rep sparse representation. Also, like if you have sparse data in TensorFlow and PyTorch, it's also good to use sparse representation because the data then take much less space on the GPU, which is nice. But also our, one our associate professor has written matrix multiplication optimized for n-gram matrices. So we have n-grams because we represent strings as n-grams and we have optimized the uh, matrix multiplication of dense matrix by n-gram, which is like four times faster than the multiplication by sparse matrix. And it's differentiable, which is nice. And if you have the, all these things with, like with support on the language level, you don't need to figure out how to do something in NumPy, PyTorch or TensorFlow because surely you know Python and then you need to learn the NumPy and TensorFlow and PyTorch, which is a bit like different lang language because if you don't do the operations inside the framework, it gets really less efficient. So that are reasons why to use Julia and now the reasons why not to use it. 
For example, we have at Avast have CI CD pipelines and we use Team City for that. Team City is great, but and you can click your things and your pipelines in the web UI, but we don't want to do that because we are proper engineers, we like configuration as a code, so we write Kotlin DSL. We have released engineering department which take care of this for most languages, so they have developed the scaffolding for like Python and other widely used languages, so you just call some functions which then call the Kotlin DSL, which makes the building of poetry package building the docker image with it, pushing it to docker register, deploying into Kubernetes cluster and it's great. But if you go there with Julia, you don't have any of that, so we needed to write all the Kotlin DSL for Julia. Which is not rocket science, but it takes some time and you need to have some people who do that actually. And as I mentioned, we are using Artifactory, which does not have support for Julia package, package registry. So we needed to figure out a way how to do this. And luckily, because Julia re package registry is a Git repo, we just have a Git repo, but we needed to create all the service accounts and figure out how to safely clone and pull the packages and so on. And of course, because Julia has a quite long code start, no one tells you how to tune it in Kubernetes cluster, so you need to figure out yourself. Also, the HTTP client now is quite good, but for example, when you are building at Avast, it's disconnected from the public internet, of course, because we want to safely publish, they publish packages to our customers, so you can't get to the public, date, public internet but all the Julia packages are on the GitHub and then mirrored on the package registry, which is again on the public internet. So you need to use proxy server, but the HTTP library for Julia didn't have good enough support for the proxy environment variables and didn't handle them properly, so I needed to send some pull requests to make it work. And there is erratic garbage collection in Kubernetes, Sometimes it's like it, we couldn't replicate it locally, so we were just debugging it inside Kubernetes cluster, which was really fun. Okay. Who, of you, who of you has heard about the malloc trim function? Okay, no one. Let me enlighten you. If you are using uh, C or glibc for uh, memory, man which is C library for memory management, you have the malloc, calloc, and then the free function. But the free function frees the memory but doesn't it free it from the process itself? It keeps the memory for the process, so the process can then use it and doesn't have to do all the negotiation with the OS. But if you are allocating lots of small chunks and then need to allocate a large chunk and then you are continuously freeing it, you are freeing it inside the process and not returning it to the OS. So the malloc trim returns the memory to OS. So we had like 50 gigabytes of RAM and we ran out of RAM because we had such huge memory leaks. So we just hacked some random calling malloc trim and it works like charm. We wanted to call it, but not that often because malloc trim can take like, yeah, like enforcing GC because you can trigger the garbage collection and then call malloc trim, but then can take like two minutes and you don't want your world to freeze for two minutes when it's running in production. So we have the we have it, like two replicas in Kubernetes and during the readiness probe there is the like random number generator and when it's lower than some magic number it triggers the garbage collection. So then during the garbage collection the pod isn't available but the second replica is used instead and the probability is low enough so they don't garbage collect at the same time. Mm -hmm. It works, it's magic, it works, it runs in the production for one year and it's quite okay. <laughs> but the disadvantage is that no one outside of your team wants to touch it and it's quite surprise. Excuse me. Can I take a vacation? Yeah, exactly or it bothers you during the vacation that the alerts that it crashed. And it's quite a surprise for new hires because you hire someone to your team and tell them there is something in Julia in production and we want you to develop some new functions to it. And yeah, we had 
someone who <laughs> left not only because of this, but it's it's not for everyone, definitely. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, you can call Julia from Python and Python from Julia, so you can think, okay, we can run, we can make all the things we need in Python and delegate to Julia only the part which Julia is really good at and don't use the whole web server in Julia but use the one in Python and just call Julia. There is the PyJulia to call Julia from Python, PyCall to call Python from Julia. It's really good for some simple examples. For example, we were writing a research paper and we included the code in Julia and the reviewers complained that it's not in Python. So we this, uh, so we decided that we'll include one example in Python using PyCall so they can run Python Jupyter Notebook and it calls the Julia packages under the hood. The integration between Python and Julia has native NumPy support which is nice because you quite often need to transfer large amounts of data and it lowers the initial learning barrier because you can just use Python and it somehow and install the Julia in it, does all the other things. So, I could show you how it looks like. Oh yes, sorry. Yeah, here I have JupyterLab and I can show you the Python and Julia. So we have the Python kernel in JupyterLab. We install the PyJulia like this. We have some Julia binary which we link there and then we can just import some Julia modules from yeah, inside the Python and here this is calling the Julia package or you can just use the eval function because both Julia and Python have eval which is really dangerous but really easy to work with if you want to show something. If you are using Jupyter it also has the magic macro so you can call Julia magic and if you type the person Julia you can write Julia code. And as I was showing the quadratic optimization, you can use Julia to compute your gradients. So you just define the NumPy arrays and then you build the loss function in Julia. You create it and then you call zygote gradient and you get your gradients. And also if you define some function in Python, you can call it from Julia like this. And this is the these are the Jupyter Notebooks for the paper. That This is the Julia kernel, so that's all native Julia, which is the language some reviewers don't want to use. So this is the Python one. So here we install the Julia. Oh, they need to have provide the Julia path to Julia binary, but it's Python kernel. And here we install all the packages, so you just can call the package manager from inside the Jupyter notebook and then use it. It just takes some time so it runs for like five minutes this cell because it needs to pre-compile all the code as I mentioned. You set up some things and then you can... Oh yeah, this was the error but it worked when I set up the environment variables properly and you can train your, define your neural network and train it. Oh yeah. yeah, and it works quite well. <laughs> but there are caveats to this <laughs> approach too. If you want to differentiate some functions, you need to define them in Julia because if you define the functions in Python and then put them to Julia, the automatic differentiation is not able to go from, from one language to the other and crashes. So you can't differentiate your code from Julia to Python. Also, transferring larger data is a bit slow. If it's NumPy array, it's okay, but if it's like large parse JSON, so the, if you have like one gigabyte large JSON, which is dictionary of arrays of dictionaries of arrays, that can get quite slow. Also, the libjulia is not thread safe, so you can't have multiple Python threads and call libjulia from each of them. That would be cool because you could have like multi-thread multi Python web server and use this. And you can say to yourself, okay, I will have multiple processes. I don't need threads in VSGI web servers. You can just type many uh, multiple processes, as you probably know. 
So you can say, okay, I want four Python processes in UFSGI or GUnicorn, and it runs. But if you want to use Julia with that, the multiple pro Python processes can't share the same Julia process. So each process runs its own Julia. And if you have a neural network in Julia, which takes one gigabyte in, of RAM, if you have four processes, it's four Julias with four gigabytes of RAM, which is unfortunate. So there is no free lunch here. And you can't easily mutate data. So if you have some, Pyth some Julia dictionary called from Py created in Python, you can't mutate it, it's immutable and you need to create the one created from, create new one created from merging the two dictionaries, which can be bothersome and can shoot you in the leg. So when to use it in production? If you have people who are willing to do this <laughs> and who are comfortable with Julia, and if you have people to take care of infrastructure or if you don't have infrastructure to take care of. And it's worth to do it if re rewrite from Python to Julia, uh, from Julia to Python would take more time than taking care of the infrastructure. For example, at Alast, we already had some packages in Julia, which some associate professor already has used, has used for a few years. And we decided, okay, let's use Julia instead of rewriting it all to Python. And that's why we have Julia in production. So if Py there are really cases where you want to use Julia and Python doesn't suffice, then it's great. And if you really do, did your due diligence. So remember these things I have told you when you will be deciding if you want to use Julia in production. Yeah, uh, the code I have shown is in this repo. So thank you for your attention and any questions. Should I read something from Slido, or is there someone wanting to ask directly? Okay, so yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. So, if you take Python syntax and you yeah. would like to run it as Julia, what, what is the blocking part? Why can't we use Python syntax to run it as Julia? Yeah, in yeah, there are some syn syntactic differences. Like in Python, you use def keyword. In Julia, you use function. And in Python, you have indentation. In Julia, you have like begin and end, which you can do programmatically, like replace it. So that would work. But some code works like this. If you have like small enough code base, it works like this. If you have larger code base, the problem is Python is object oriented. Julia is not. So you have structures. You don't have objects. So in Python, you have the inheritance. You ju in Julia, we have multiple dispatch. So then if you get to objects, you can't do it one-to-one -one because you need to translate the, inheri the inheritance to multiple dispatch. Okay. okay, another question. And, sorry. Um, what is the hiring situation? Uh, do people <laughs> on the job market know Julia or do you train them in-house? <laughs> yeah, uh, we have hired some people to our team and so uh, I think none of them has known Julia before, so we trained them in-house. So far we have hired some senior people who are able to learn Julia. Or at least they heard about Julia from one of associate professors who is really promoting Julia at the university. So they have heard about it and then they learned it at work. So yeah, they have, they have learned it and we are hiring and also two teams that don't use Julia. We are using Python quite a lot and are hiring for <laughs> Python <laughs> positions, which is important. Okay. Uh, so then maybe just, just, to, just, just to have some, some like feeling about it, uh, how many more people uh, know Python than Julia? Do you know like the ratio? Can you guess, I don't know, is it 100 to one or is it like 1000 to one? It's, I think it's like really hard to guess because I guess that is the problem with the level because there, I guess that there would be 100 to 1 if you consider the people that are learning how to program and are just typing the hello world, then there is a huge amount of people who are learning to program and really their first programming steps in Python. There's loads of them. That's why Python is one of the most popular languages and number of Julia people doing this is really small, but 
if you're like really like strong machine learning engineers, then I think the ratio is less that just there is the bigger gap between the good senior engineers and beginners in Python than in Julia. Of course, in Julia, the, there is less senior people, but there is more senior people than beginners in Julia compared to Python. Okay. Uh, okay. So another question. Uh, given the, a bit provocative one. Uh, given the number of issues, is it still worth it? Have you thought about reverting back to Python or some other language? We are actually doing this. <laughs> 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 because at the beginning it wasn't planned to deploy so many production applications and on the way we decided okay we need to deploy more things to production so the shortest path to, was to use Julia but if we had known the grand plan from the beginning we would have used Python probably. Okay, so there's another question that I don't probably understand well. Uh, is Julia more stable, uh, probably with regards to Python, or...? Well, depends on like which level of stability you mean. I think like the ecosystem is more unstable because it's still evolving, so the chance that some package would get like Abandoned, I think, is a bit greater in Julia than in Python. So the, like, I think, in this regard, the Python is more stable. But I'm thinking about the like different like interpretations of stability. I think, like, definitely, if you consider type stability, Julia is more type stable than Python. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah, I think it's a bit, yeah, maybe a bit like more stable in production in the manner in the sense that in Julia once the code is compiled the runtime of the code get, has lower variance because it's the, the interpreter doesn't do some magic there but in Python the peaks can get a bit higher because the interpreter is a bit more magical than the compiler when the when there is some long runtime I think Another question from the audience? So the, the transition from Julia to Python does it have a price tag? You know, like, are you going to pay more for the servers? Or? I don't know about this kind of price tag. Definitely, it's <clears throat> like with people, it's simpler to hire people from, for Python than for Julia, but I don't know for the servers if it's cheaper in runtime for Julia or Python. Yeah, because we're not in cloud, we're on-prem, so we just use the hardware we have and we don't know how much did it cost when they were buying it. <laughs> okay, so maybe I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in the last meetup, uh, there was a talk about how to uh, compile the Python interpreter to WebAssembly and uh, how to actually run Python code uh, within the browser. Do you think it would be possible to do something like that uh, in Julia, for Julia? Well, Julia, uh, I don't know if WebAssembly is compatible with LLVM. If it is, then it's possible. Mm -hmm. If it isn't, then not. Okay, so it's like the, the, the hard requirement that it must Yeah, be. yeah, but also the Rust is using LLVM, I think. Mm -hmm. So it boils down to like similar thing as Rust in Rust to WebAssembly. Okay, any other questions? Okay, okay. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, uh, PyJulia, so the package you called Julia yeah. for Python was not um, thread safe. Could you use async IO perhaps to avoid threading and use it still asynchronously? I think you could. Yeah, with yeah with async IO, I think it would work, but I haven't tried that. Okay. So if there are not any other questions, uh, we have thanks thanks Maki. Yeah.